economic mercy. <laughs> and I do emphasize the word prophet in that prophetic voice. Well, spirit and economic mercy. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. You guys are in for a treat today, because after what I do, you get a neat performance that's going to be coming up with, with uh, Marvin and Dale. It's going to be an awful lot of fun. But I'm going to start out by providing two perspectives on mercy. The first is a generic definition, and the second is more of a religious definition that you probably would expect from a church. Uh, first of all, mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness for someone that you have the power to harm. The roots of mercy are derived from the Greek words for compassion and pity, and then loving kindness. We all have an intuitive feel about that. Now, in religious terms, mercy is often referred to as an act performed by God to not harm anyone or any humans, even though they have not lived a perfect life. Many religious groups pray to God for mercy, and to me, prayers for mercy sound like a sketch that should be from a Monty Python movie. Um, it might sound something like, Dear God, please be merciful to us miserable sinners and don't squash us like so many worthless bugs. This perspective sort of equates God to a five-year-old stomping around on an anthill, or re equates it to corporations who are stomping around our country today. Mercy is seen as a quality in and from God that directs him to stay in relationship with people who absolutely do not deserve to be in relationship with an omnipotent being. Of course, this perspective ignores our first principle, which is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So at this stage, you might be wondering, how does a concept of mercy fit in with the UU sermon? Well, I'm going to answer your question by branching off from typical perspectives and taking a look at what I refer to as economic morality and mercy in the economy and how it's changed in the last couple of generations. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, the economy of Europe and North America and the colonies were governed by a variety of formal and informal regulations. They were designed to prevent greed from overcoming morality. Examples of, of these traditional Christian and Muslim cultural rules were, for instance, usury, which imposed religious values on economic activity. You weren't allowed to charge interest for people if you were loaning them money. Now, I don't believe anybody could refer to our current capitalistic economy as a merciful or moral economy today. Instead, especially since the Reagan tax cuts, our country's economic structure is really and truly set up to benefit those who already have the greatest number of advantages and to disadvantage those who are the most vulnerable. The tax system, the courts, medicine, education, toll roads, and much of our society have been set up to provide advantages who, to people who really don't need them. And now that corporations are people, and that corporations can have religious beliefs, and that corporations can have free speech, corporations have become the gods of our economy. Small g. Money may be amoral, but since the 1980s and the days of Gordon Gekko, greed has become a new religion and is used to worship our corporate gods. And mercy seems to play very little role among any of these adherents to this religion. A few generations ago, corporations had a different perspective. They had a greater degree of social responsibility. Employers used to practically guarantee a job for life. Changing jobs was seen as a black mark on your record. My dad worked for the same company, the a &PT company, for 27 years. During my parents' generations, corporations also had an implied social contract to take care of their workers and not just maximize profits. Nowadays, if corporations don't try to maximize profits, they can actually be sued by their shareholders for that. But in those days, retirement funds were taken care of by corporations, and mom and dad didn't have to develop the expertise to become money managers. In those days, health care was provided for the family and was provided for the worker and their spouse all the way through retirement. One of the questions we need to ask today is, should the government and our whole economy be set up to give more and greater advantages to those who already are most advantaged? In the 1980s, corporate retirement funds were, in place, were replaced with IRAs. Individuals were suddenly expected to develop the expertise to manage their own money. And in spite of the best efforts of Obamacare, healthcare, healthcare is still a system that provides the greatest benefits to insurance companies. Healthcare is not a right. It has become a mandated commodity and we have to pay for it every single month. Back in my days, companies often had a sense of social responsibility that seems to have evaporated. When a campaign would occur, 
The large corporations in the community would sit down and figure out if they're building a new hospital or a new wing, how much money they were going to contribute. And then after they decided that, the rest of the amount would be contributed by the, the community. That'd be about 25 to 50%. But corporations played a significant role. When corporations, what they've forgotten is that merciful economic policies help develop a just society. And just societies, without riots, help ensure co corporate profitability. Henry Ford knew that if he paid his workers enough money they would buy his cars, and he would become more profitable. Now today is May 1st, is May Day, International Workers' Day. As we look over the history of work and the relationship between workers and their employers, we see a continuum of corporate responsibility. We used to believe that anybody in this country could grow up to be wealthy or president. However, today we realize that the economic system really and truly is rigged. In addition to having to pay for retirement and health care, a nationwide effort to crush unions, unions has helped demolish the middle class. My former father-in-law belonged to a union, raised a family of seven on a high school education with a paper mill job, two cars, and a vacation home. Ah, let's take a quick look at the stock market and see how it's changed in the last number of years. Institution, the stock market, is touted as free market capitalism in the flesh. However, individuals with computers have caused the whole stock market to crash. Remember the 2010 flash crash? That was caused by a gentleman with a computer who put in, and, and it, it was a crash for 36 minutes. Um, five years after that crash, the Department of Justice listed 22 criminal counts, including fraud and market mani manipulation against Navinder Singh Serao, a traitor. Among the charges was spoofing algorithms, because just prior to the flash crash, he placed thousands of future contracts that were supposed to be canceled. These orders amounted to $200 million worth of bets that the market would fail. And they were replaced or modified with his computer 19,000 times before they were canceled. Now, of course, we've learned from that fiasco, and spoofing is illegal, and layering and front-running are not banned, and laws were passed to level the playing field. But four months after the Department of Justice provided that report, we had another stock market flash crash in 2015, and the Dow dropped another 1,100 points in the first five minutes of trading. Trading was halted more than 1,200 times that day. And this time, the, they say the crash was caused by a lack of liquidity, panic, and high-frequency trading. Now what we've learned is that if you and I are doing everything right, those with greater assets can eliminate all of your life savings, all of your retirement funds in a matter of minutes through their market manipulation. We also see that much touted free speech, which is necessary for a democracy in elections, are now drowned out by the billion dollar megaphones of the ultra wealthy Koch brothers. They're spending 900 million, close to a billion dollars, to influence our election this year. Now, if you think that voting doesn't matter, you need to ask yourself, why would these gentlemen spend so much in, in order to influence our elections? We know that voting matters, and it's the one thing that we have and we need to continue doing. Now, in contrast to these corporations on the far left, remember Oscar Schindler from Schindler's <coughs> List? Yes. He was an industrialist, he was a spy, he was a Nazi, but he's credited with saving lives of 1,200 people. Wikipedia reports he protected his Jewish workers from deportation and death in the death camps. Initially, Schindler was interested in making money. He began shielding his workers from the Nazis without regard for the cost, without regard for corporate profitability. He had to give larger and larger bribes to the Nazi officials and luxury items obtainable only on the black market, so he violated laws in order to save people. On the far right today, we have corporations that seem to have no social responsibility and get a great deal of corporate welfare. Last May, Sam Becker in the cheat sheet wrote, in the US it is rather commonplace to see welfare recipients demonized. Those who need welfare, those who need food stamps, those who need health, are regularly demonized in our country. They're called lazy and incompetent, but there are millions who definitely need these social programs to keep them surviving. However, if we take a look at just eight of the biggest corporate 
welfare recipients, we see that they have $33 billion in tax breaks and subsidies. These include Boeing, Alcoa, Intel, General Motors, Ford, Fiat Chrysler, Royal Dutch Shell, and Nike. Now, does taking this money make them, excuse me, bad? I don't think so. But corporations with profitability don't need government handouts. They don't need subsidies. And when corporate people and corporate lobbyists help write the rules and the laws, we shouldn't be too surprised that those laws favor the corporations. Now, true results of this increasing wealth concentration are a decrease in the middle class and a decrease in middle class wages, which have stagnated since the 1970s. Intuitively, you and I know it's not right that someone who makes a living by signing checks should have a lower tax rate than somebody who swings a hammer every day. We know that Mitt Romney should not pay a 14% income tax while people doing construction pay close to 50%. In a recent article from The Guardian, Anthony Gauguin, associate professor of law at Drake, wrote, income inequality and the decline of the middle class has made the rich, made the rich a popular target on the campaign trail this year. The best example is the rem remarkable success of Bernie Sanders, who's called for a political revolution against the billionaire class. But this populism is also on the right from Donald Trump, who is a billionaire, so the message is a little bit skewed on that side. Sanders and other populists did not, populists did not create the class tensions in America. Instead, wealthy Americans played a central role in creating the conditions that gave rise to the angry populist mood of our nation. The economic data, data make it clear why this is such a problem. Although America has the largest economy in the world, real wages have not gone up since 1972 because workers have experienced stagnating, stagnating incomes for decades. Across middle-income America, middle-income Americans are facing a precipitous future. Median income has fallen over 80% throughout American countries since, two, since 2000. It's a trend that's accelerating. Even mortality rates reflect growing income inequality. Poor and rural Americans now die at rates well above those of wealthy Americans. Meanwhile, the rich are getting richer. A study by Pew Research Center found that the median net worth of the upper income families is now 70 times greater than that of lower income families. In 2015, the 400 richest families had a combined wealth of $2.3 trillion. Over 75% of the nation's wealth is held by 10% of the population, and the, richest, the gap between the rich and the middle class is the greatest it's ever been. Now, since the 80s, rich Americans have maximized their share of the nation's prosperity at the expense of everybody else in the country. And adding an insult to injury, a growing body of evidence suggests that many rich people today do not care about their fellow Americans. The old com uh, concept of noblesse oblige has declined among the wealthy. Even though we live in times of entrenched income inequality, poor Americans actually give a higher percentage of their income to nonprofit organizations and to charities than do the rich. The lack of generosity among the upper classes shows no signs of abating. Although the overall wealth of the upper class is growing, levels of charity giving are falling among the rich. Uh, it's this this uh, concept is also demonstrated through the CEO salaries. Compensation rates have soared for CEOs. In 1965, the typical CEO made 20 times more than the average worker. Today, the CEO to worker pay ratio is over 300 times to one. Turning point came in the Reagan era in the 1980s. You guys remember Gordon Gekko? He said, greed is good. That was the declaration. <laughs> Gecko's worship of wealth continues to reflect the attitude of American upper classes. Wealthy interest groups have hired lobbyists, armies of lobbyists, to prevent tax increases in Congress and to block government investigations into corporate wrongdoing. Despite a soaring share of the nation's wealth, the rich go to enormous, length, enormous lengths to avoid paying taxes and they found that over $36 billion has been moved to offshore tax havens. The ultra-rich have poured money into campaigns of the candidates who will continue to cut government programs that benefit the middle and working class Americans, as well as public schools and healthcare. Now, a few prominent billionaires, such as Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, have continued the noble tradition of philanthropy. 
In 2010, the Giving Pledge campaign was started, and that campaign is, if you're going to be part of this organization, you have to give at least 50% of your assets away, either while you're alive or while you're dead. Since that time, this $731 billion has been added to the Giving Pledge. So not all wealthy people are selfish, greedy misers. There is an undercurrent of people doing good and an undercurrent of corporations that are trying to do good while doing well. Now it shouldn't come as a surprise that the middle class and the working class are angry. But until Buffett and Gates families become the rule rather than the exception, we've got some problems. Finally, if a financial emergency struck, let's say a health problem or a car needed repair, would you personally, you don't have to tell me, don't answer the question, would you have $400 to come up with for that repair? Last week, according to the Federal Reserve Board, 47% of Americans would have trouble coming up with money. They'd have to sell something, borrow money, or they simply could not pay $400 if they had an unexpected emergency. And this is true for people who consider themselves middle class or upper, upper middle class. Neil Gabler is one of them. I don't know if any of you guys heard this story last week, but he's a successful writer with five books under his belt. He's a visiting professor at State Department of New York, Stony Brook, and in an article from The Atlantic, he admits to, have, admits to having financial impotence. I know what it's like to juggle creditors, he says, to make it through a week. I know what it's like to have to swallow my pride and consistently dun people to pay me so that I can pay others. I know what it's like to have liens slapped on me, to have my bank account levied by creditors, and I know what it's like to be down to my last five dollars, literally my last five dollars while I wait for a paycheck to arrive. And I know what it's like to subsist for days on a diet of eggs. And I know what it's like to have to borrow money from my adult daughters because my wife and I ran out of heating oil. I'm gonna end this discussion with an adaptation which might be the most famous quote about mercy. Waiting to see who's smiling. All right, the first few words are spoken by Portia from The Merchant of Venice, and then I'm going to change it just a little bit. The quality of mercy is not strained. It has been mutilated, pureed, liquefied <laughs> by the ultra-rich as if in a blender. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now I invite uh, Barbara Schilling, who is uh, our living embodiment of the spirit of uh, justice, mercy, with justice. And uh, I'm going to have a wonderful opportunity to interview uh, the spirit of mercy as justice. So uh, why don't you join me, good spirit? Or, I know you know her as, as Barbara, but she's the spirit of justice right now. So. It's good to be with you, Dale, and everybody else. <laughs> well, as I shared with you before, uh, we are honored this morning to explore several aspects of mercy as a human gift, not just through some dry academic discussion, but literally from the living embodiments of mercy. Four. So, first, let us, we're going to speak to uh, Spirit of Mercy as Justice. Now, uh, your work is as old as a human species, I suspect. Yes, indeed. And while much mercy Injustice has improved greatly over the centuries. There is much work to be done. Well, tell me of your latest concerns. Of course, there is work all over the world, but today I raise up a local issue to you, your country, the United States. Your country provides itself, prides itself for freedom and justice for all, and this is an admirable, admirable goal and one hard fought for. A good example in this era is those persons who seek to examine and change the too often held concept that justice equals uncompromising harshness, that this harshness will somehow reform and show defendants and perpetrators the error of their ways. The problem is, in the zeal to execute this idea, leaders and those in power accept systematic shortcuts to get people in prison. Well, could you give me an example? One of your current champions is a man named Brian Stevenson, who founded a legal practice called the Equal Justice Initiative. His observation was that many persons, the poor, children, women, and people of color, were treated within a system that valued incarceration as a primary goal, not guilt, not evidence, and certainly not as my celebrated sister who holds the scales of justice and covers her eyes to not be biased. 
would act. One example is a man Brian fought for, Walter McMillan, who was wrongfully prosecuted and found guilty of murder. One little problem, as Brian found, the evidence was flimsy and biased. The powers that be wanted a quick conviction. Any other examples? Yes, consider that after the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, studies found that the entire system of ju court justice in Ferguson was literally a setup as a revenue-raising operation to fund local government. Well, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but could you tell us why that could be wrong? Well, because judges, in collusion with the local government, were encouraged to incarcerate people, often people of color, if they could not pay a traffic ticket. The extra fines would go up and up, going into the hundreds of dollars, making people choose between rent, food for their children, or the fines. When a police officer stopped someone, the system in place helped create a community where people had many outstanding warrants. The system would not allow for community service or leniency on the part of the judge. Pay up now or go to jail. As mercy, I would say to you, a system of justice is not a for-profit enterprise. It is a way of creating just community. This was plainly wrong. You're right. How can we help and what must we do? First, help those who are challenging the obvious examples of persons who are caught up in these systems that demonize people as units of currency or political points, allowing public officials to approve how tough they are on crime while ignoring the basic practices of justice, evidence, patterns of bias, and the whole point of justice create compassion and community. Look for people in the system who do the right thing and look for ways to live out the principles of restorative justice and reconciliation. But just as important, gather together people of diverse backgrounds in your communities to study and question where the system of justice has been bent, skewed, even designed to profit someone financially, politically, at the expense of the most vulnerable among you. Then together work to change it. I have seen people with differing backgrounds, ideas, and stations in life work together on issues such as mass incarceration and extreme drug <coughs> and sentencing. So keep on working together. It will always take a long path, but be patient and you will persevere. Well, you, I really appreciate what you've told us. Any parting words for us? In the end, as I once observed at a hospital, were these words about mercy. They come from the Christian tradition, but they apply to any culture and any time. Our ministry is to, one, feed the hungry, two, give drink to the thirsty, three, shelter the homeless, four, clothe the naked, five, visit the prisoner, six, visit the sick, seven, bury the dead. If we lived these as guiding principles, wouldn't mercy temper the harshness of our society and justice system? Among you, seek ways to personally live out of compassion and avoid harm, even when it might seem just. Seek the road of reconciliation. I am so appreciative, Barbara, and the spirit of justice and mercy that you've joined us this morning, and thank you so much. Uh, you're inspiring us to do good work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.